you are twice as likely to go back to eating meat if you live with a meat eater. So this idea that isn't it beneficial for a vegan to date a meat eater and then, you know, they can convert them to veganism. It actually happens the other way as well. And in my circle, it's happened more the other way than it has, you know, in the way that we think it should. Hi there and welcome to Plant CEO. In today's episode, I'd like to welcome Lewis Foster, the CEO of Grazer, which is the meat-free matchmaking app. Hey Lewis, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. Very well. Thank you for having me. We basically need more vegans to basically get together and have babies because, uh, you know, in terms of saving the environment, that's that's what we need to aim for, isn't it? Yeah, that's a big argument for Grazer. Um, <laughs> yeah, create a vegan army somehow and um, yeah, having two like-minded partners coming together and creating like-minded uh, offspring is probably a, a good way of going about it <laughs> that's a long-term vision but yeah what motivated you in the beginning that you started it was it 2017 yeah so I was a film director and I was doing music video mostly but I was being prepped to be a commercial director by an agency that I was signed to and the first advert I was asked to pitch on was for KFC and I was about five year vegan at that point and it really kind of was a bit of an awakening for me and it made me you know, question what I was doing. And I decided to quit and I moved home and thought, okay, I, I wanna do something for the vegan movement. What can I do? And dating was one of those things that I heard a lot of people talk about how hard it is to find a vegan partner. I was actually in a relationship with a vegan at the time, but particularly from straight women saying, you know, how do I find a vegan man? Straight men in the vegan community are, you know, in, you know they're in the minority so how, how do you find someone and so yeah i started working on that problem and at the time there was a couple of vegan dating apps that were really terrible i thought okay i could do better than this so yeah i moved home and you know, put all my savings into it and thought yeah i'll give this a go yeah i could understand what that meant especially if you're in the creative industry you know my day jobs in in marketing and sometimes i feel the same way you might be working a client that doesn't align with your own personal values so for you having to work on kfc was probably a great turning point actually for you to like you know what i, I don't want to be in this industry anymore in terms of not having to work with those companies that are actually doing more harm. So it's very commendable of you to do that, actually. So just wanted to ask you, you were in filmmaking and in making music videos. Anything that we might know, any artists that you worked with or what sort of films and music videos were you shooting? I directed two music videos for Rudimental, the UK yeah. band. God, it's such a long time ago now. I've done a few other kind of more indie bands, done some stuff with Wolf Alice, which are Grammy nominated. Um, Labyrinth. Yeah. Yeah, I've done a yeah, few. awesome. Yeah, 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 it's really good. Are you still in touch with your music side? The actual process of being a music video director is pretty harrowing. Like you, you, you get a song you have to pitch on, and you listen to it over and over again, and you try and think of an idea around this music, and you just get so bored of listening to music. I kind of was just, just over it. So at the moment, I and the only music I listen to are nursery rhymes from my son. <laughs> so I, I'm completely <laughs> out out of the loop with what's going on in in pop culture completely. Yeah. So when you made the switch then, did you get into the actual product side in terms of development or did you work with somebody else to bring that in and you focused on other parts of the business? How did you actually go and create this app? I studied graphic design and particularly typography. So I had that kind of base that I could apply to creating the UI of that um, yeah. brand. So no, I did get help it was from other designers, but essentially I built the UI of the app. And then I got a freelance developer to come and build the MVP and then had to completely rebuild that in like no, 18 months time, start again from scratch to build something that's more robust and is designed to scale. But yeah, I went through a whole learning process of, you know, this whole new world I've never kind of dipped my toe into. And there's definitely mistakes I've made and things I've learned along the way. Yeah. Can you share some of the main stats now that you've got to after these years that you've been doing this, you know, what sort of markets that you're in, the usage, you know, the matches, I guess. I can't divulge like actual user base, but I can say that our biggest market now is in London, south of England. That's where we see most of our usership and we're getting to a point where, you know, there is some semblance of density. Any kind of dating app requires not just users, but particularly density of users for it to function and get a critical mass. We're a bit off getting that 
critical mass in London, but we've made a good stab at it. We've only done one significant marketing campaign and that was targeted around London. We haven't had the budget to simply, you know, yeah. And the US is the biggest, you know, dating app market by far. But the problem with the US is everyone's spread out. So you really need to have yeah. the budget and the strategy to kind of put your flag down over there. Right. And our focus now, I mean, we've seen a you know, really good user metrics when it comes to acquisition, like crazy good acquisition costs. Right. But we don't have the user base to, you know, the retention, you know, we, we have a drop off in retention because imagine, you know, download the app and then, you know, there's only 10 people in your area. You're probably not going to use the app, you know, a month or two from now. That is a real problem that we're yet to tackle and we need a budget to do that. And thankfully, we've just raised our seed round so we can, you know, start doing those things. Yeah. And congratulations on raising your seed round. What was the seed round for this this one that you've done just now? And what's the total investment that you've had so far? So we raised six hundred thousand pounds, and in total, our lifetime we've had around one point one million. And that investment has lasted us a long time. We've had to spread that out over a long period to give ourselves the best chance of raising. We found it particularly difficult to raise, and I know the market is not in a great place for vegan businesses. So it's been, you know, a turbulent time, but we've managed to, you know, adapt, change, and mm. to get us over the line. Which I'm, um, yeah, happy about. Um, what sort of investors do you have on board now that you've? Uh managed to get so we have a mix of investors from our previous round the this round we just closed is from one investor but the previous round we have a mix of friends family seasoned angel investors and also bimini they're a, a drag queen from the uk they invested and they propped up our marketing campaign to only marketing campaign in the uk they were the face of it or the the rear of it <laughs> you could say <laughs> Yeah. Is Bimini vegan as well? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're proper vegan. They've been vegan for a while. They big into like fashion and they use lots of like recycled and, you know, thrifted stuff. They're, they're, they're proper, proper vegan. Yeah. Yeah. I saw the campaign and it was kind of a genius play on words, I guess, with F vegans, basically. And now you can finally F vegans. <laughs> what was the sort of response that you had back on that? Because if people didn't really know that it was kind of a dating app, you would think, oh, but I guess it got you a lot of attention. So I think that was a good strategy. Yeah, that was the idea is to get some attention, but also show a bit of personality. We want to be a challenger brand and we want to show that, you know, vegans can poke fun at themselves. Taking that kind of anti-vegan message, turning it on its head and being a bit transparent about the problems that vegans face and, you know, poking, poking fun at ourselves is a way of introducing meat eaters in on the joke and start the conversation. So we got a lot of traction from that and we, we got a lot of press. I all of a sudden was on like LBC and we we're in the Times and all that kind of stuff. And actually that post, so we did an Instagram post with Bimini and that post was seen by over half a million Instagram accounts and we were on, you know, lots of people's for you pages. So yeah, it was really a successful kind of twist on a marketing strategy that, you know, was was pretty simple and low cost to create. So yeah. Yeah, amazing. What's been the response from your app? And and I agree it's really well designed and put together, by the way. Can you share any sort of success stories that you've had so far? Yeah, yeah. So just to make it clear, so Grazer is not only a dating app, we're a friend finding app too. Around 20% of our users are on the friend finding space. And we certainly had lots of feedback from people saying, you know, I've met my best friend on there. Um, so we've definitely made a, a, a dent in the kind of vegan friend finding community. Right. Um, We've had multiple marriages. We've even had a few grazer babies. I was invited to a baby shower like a year ago. Oh, brilliant. Um, Yeah. It's definitely definitely working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. One of the things is that vegans can feel isolated, especially if they change their dietary habits and maybe it's not aligned with their families and they might move away to a different town and don't have very many friends. So I guess that's great what you're doing. But what sort of advice would you give to those vegans that are especially feeling isolated yeah i mean just to sum up the problem 63 percent of vegans feel isolated by their diet choice wow a lot of vegans are out there feeling like they're alone and i think having a dietary restriction has been shown to increase the chance of depression and those kind of things so it's a serious problem that we have because we're against the grain when it comes to the norm in terms of advice i would say you know, finding your local community is important. Join local groups, go to offline events. Something that I see not a lot of vegans doing, which is participating in animal rights. You know, connect mm. to animal rights groups, go to events and, you know, meet meet people who are advocates, be inspired. Those kind of things really help kind of fill up the mojo, the vegan mojo and, and keep you going. 
and then you know obviously online join online communities reddit grazer you know anything where you can facebook groups where you can find your pockets of people and even you know there are niches within vegan movement you know there's you've got you know gamers trans vegans you know find find your group of people and then you know connect with them um i think that's so valuable yeah that's good advice any recommendations on animal rights groups that you've seen that other people joining or any other groups that you can mention you know, shout out i guess one thing we have a problem with actually and we've done some research on it is vegans not participating in animal rights because mm. they don't know of the groups that exist a lot of people have heard of peter and that's about it and a lot of people spend their time helping which is admirable helping sanctuaries or uh, wildlife animals but there is a mm. big hole which is farmed animal charities are not getting the the resources they need. Only 12% of animal cause donations go to farmed animal charities. I get it because the movement is so fractured. There's so many groups doing amazing work, but it's hard to find unless you're a, a hardcore advocate. It's hard to follow. But um, there are some really great groups. There's people like Animal Equality, Animal Equality UK, uh, the Humane League, Mercy for Animals. There's lots of great groups. And there are, there are smaller ones that are doing, you know, more hardcore stuff and ones that are doing more like corporate outreach there's there's a whole mix of organizations that you can get your, your hands into yeah for sure i went with we stand for the animals in leicester square you know where you show the cuba truth if you like and that was quite an experience i mean obviously leicester square is quite a dynamic place to be in actually it was quite nice because you know you would have the people who want to stand there and then the other volunteers would be around talking to the public so the idea would be that you wouldn't necessarily have to engage them unless they stop and they're looking and they're, you know, if they're just like, you know, don't want to see this sort of stuff. But most of the footage was like from Dominion or, you know, Earthlings, for example. And then to basically engage in that conversation where somebody might say, you know, I've been a vegetarian and I haven't really managed to. And then what was interesting is that they would actually say, if somebody says, you know, yeah, I want to try and do this step by step, their position would be to say, no, you have to basically have a cutoff because every time you make a small increments of removing, I guess, dairy or milk or fish, meat, animals are still dying in that process. So their opinion is you have to make a hard cut, which I think is a good thing for animal rights organizations to basically go out and say, because it's true, because every time every um even though you're making a change you kind of need to go excuse the pun but cold turkey on it really so i think it's it's a really good way and i agree that you, you meet so many nice people who who are part of this community and you get to experience firsthand what they go through you may not want to be the person in the front line i guess because you might have people we actually had one person come up to to somebody else on the cube and like you know, show a burger in their in their face, and the the thing is that you you don't react, you don't get uh, emotionally attached to that, because also you've got to understand people are on their own journey. So I really think it's a it's a great thing to do, and yeah, we we definitely need these communities to happen. Are you doing real life events? I guess uh, something that you're organising is that something part of uh, what you want to do or have done? Yeah, so I mean, it's part of our future vision. So our focus for the next twelve months is to really get a solid dating app uh, predominantly dating app product into the market so increasing the amount of features on offer implementing our premium subscription and then our idea is once we create a, a sustainable business model we're then going to start exploring other more impact things that we can do and one of them is offline events not only putting on them ourselves but also housing you know onboarding other people's events onto our platform so people can go and understand if those events like local to them yeah that's a great idea um, what are you thinking, I, I guess the, the money that you've raised, you really want to focus on on the product side. What sort of features are you looking to sort of create or enhance? So a big thing and our kind of mission in general is to provide a space where plant-based people can express themselves. So on mainstream dating apps, around half of vegans don't mention their diet on their profile for fear of rejection. Um, so what we want to do is provide a space where they feel like they can say, hey, I'm vegan and this is me. Um, so we've built kind of our features we have right now are features that are designed to kind of accentuate that. So we have questions and answers that you fill out on your profile that about half of the questions that you can answer are vegan related. We have badges that you can stick on your profile and they're all kind of vegan puns or you know things that are kind of yeah. 
I knew as a person a little bit more. Like one of them's soy boy, slut for vegans, militant vegans, that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's a fun aspect to get noticed as well on your profile, I guess. As much as possible, we're trying to build a way for you to feel like you can connect with that person. So if you match with that person, we want you to have as many little moments that you can spark a conversation with. You know, if you've just got an image and you know a really basic bio, how do you engage in a meaningful conversation from the get-go? It's difficult. So we're trying to make our profiles you know, as high quality as possible to give us as many moments to 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 have that post-match interaction. Um, when it comes to our kind of future vision, we want to onboard a few more features that do that highlight personality. We will be doing things like you'll be able to change your location, you get unlimited likes, you get to send a DM directly as a premium. And then in the future, we have this kind of long vision goal of being more of a community hub. So dating is the driver of our revenue and then have this community aspect which you know we want anyone to be able to download grazer whether they're in a relationship married or, or not and try and add value as much as we can to try and make it feel like vegans have a home and one thing that you know is kind of crazy is that 84 or in the us 84 percent of vegans and vegetarians went back to eating meat and if we believe the recent data were well, from 2003, veganism in the US went from 3% to 1% from 2018 to 2023. So that's a significant jump. And a real problem we have facing the movement is recidivism. The research we have suggests that the biggest markers of you know recidivism are due to social pressures and culture. So we want to elevate that pressure, that social pressure and help vegans find their bubble to try and reduce that churn so our features will be designed specifically to try and reduce reduce churn and find your people and your hub you know on, on grazer would you yeah. plan to also launch it onto web then if it's going to be more like a community application not just on the mobile yeah we will do that for sure that is a bit further down the line but yeah we will do that yeah, that's a great idea. I think it's great that you're planning to do that. You spoke about the density and London being the core city right now where you've got most traction of users and activity. Is there another place that you'd like to focus on outside of London? Yeah, we have a target list of cities yeah. based across the UK, US and parts of Europe. To be honest, we're probably you know a little bit further away from being able to define our top targets, but obviously, you know, New York, LA are huge and then you've got berlin and you've got other places in europe in poland and beyond that would be a good place to start yeah, yeah definitely yeah what are you doing at the moment to drive user acquisition and after you've done the enhancements the product enhancements what are your plans marketing wise we rely completely on organic downloads and we have done for a long time so we did the f vegans campaign and we did a bit of testing we showed metrics so that we could take to investors and say you know these types of marketing work better then this type of marketing, this type of marketing is perhaps better for like general market penetration. So like the amount of vegans who know have heard about Grazer. The out of home, for example, drives more of that kind of aspect, whereas online ads drives direct downloads. And we understand how we're going to do it on a more global scale. Partly the reason why we're doing so much on our product is we want to make the product so good that everyone recommends it to their friends. Um, right. Without the stickiness factor. And I think um I think it's called the K factor actually, which is um, you know, how much are you willing to recommend this? product or service to your friend we want to make that as strong as possible to reduce the amount we need to spend on marketing and then we want to do some kind of clever activations on a local scale and kind of take it city by city as we go yeah yeah nice in terms of the user base what sort of split is there at the moment because you are tracking whether they're vegans or vegetarians right yeah so vegan vegetarian or plant-based so around 75 percent of our users are vegan five percent are plant-based and the rest are vegetarian okay and so Something that's actually really interesting about our platform, which is unique, is that just less than half of our users are female. Around 3% are non-binary and the rest are men. On Tinder, 75% of the user base are men. On Bumble, I think it's around 67% of the user base are men. So there's this real like offset of user base, which makes it harder for people to find matches, particularly men. So, you know, men are vying for a minority of the user base. So they're having to pay to get matches and have a good experience um and there's a lot more drop off because you know people are getting frustrated with mm. constantly swiping not getting matches um mm. so that kind of more parity is something that's unique to our community obviously because more women are vegans than men so yeah it's quite a unique place we're in yeah for sure and tell me about what the difference between the free access is versus the premium subscription right now we're completely free 
So we don't have any uh, revenue on our on our platform. So there are some limits though that you have. So you can only like a certain amount of times in one day. So you can't just keep sending loads and loads of likes. That is the only kind of limit we have at the moment. The premium subscription will allow you to send direct messages, will allow you to stand out more from other profiles, change your location. So say, for example, you're going to go to a city on a business trip or on a holiday, you can try and swipe in that area. So set up as many matches as you can, things like that. We're certainly not reinventing the wheel when it comes to dating apps. We're trying to provide a good product to a community that needs it and speak to them, you know, build a product that allows them to find their place we're not doing anything like super crazy and you know trying to reinvent how people meet on dating apps how would you guarantee that safety of your users as well the safety is a difficult thing for dating apps because there is a rise of people using platforms to try and scam or catfishes one thing we're implementing which is a top priority for us post raise is a verification so you can verify your profile and the other user can see if you're verified or not. Right now, we rely on users reporting bad behavior or suspicious activity. And then once we get that report, we can look into it and ban users from the platform. But we will implement some kind of AI technology that will allow us to look at suspicious behavior and you know shadow ban them or block them so they have limited exposure or, or no exposure so we're trying to stop it before it happens yeah and do you put anything on your app about safety especially after meeting somebody and if so say somebody's going to meet them in person what sort of advice they should have we have it in our terms and conditions and our privacy we don't have anything in the app that you know if you match with someone that you don't get a notification to say you know be careful and stuff some of the mainstream apps have a section in the profile so when you build out your profile there's in like the settings page there's like tips like safety tips and we may include something like that mm. you know meeting in a public place you know where there's lots of other people etc and yeah yeah exactly don't don't hand over your you know any kind of details or details yeah 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 yeah. yeah, cool. What's your position on the other vegan or vegetarian focused dating apps? And where do you see the, the market size, I guess, for this? So the market size is there are other apps on the market for <clears throat> other niches with similar market size that are doing very well. An example we've used is Muds, a dating app for Muslims. They have around 10 million users. Their biggest markets are the US, France and the UK. And in the US, around 1% of the US are Muslim, around 5% in the UK and around 3% in Canada. So they're kind mm. of like on parity with our kind of market size. And by the way, the US accounts for like a third of all dating app revenue. If you don't have exposure there, your revenue is going to be severely cut. So they're a good example of something that we think we can achieve in the next few years. When it comes to other dating apps on the market that are designed for vegans and vegetarians, we feel like the, both the brand and the product don't stand up to the, the market as it is today. And I think, you know, Gen Z millennials expect more. And it is tough Like um, to create a good app. It's hard. You need budget. You need good developers. You need a good strategy. Mm. You don't only need to build an app, but you need to maintain it. It's really difficult. So I understand it. But um, yeah, we mm. feel like we've got a good grasp of what we need to do and we have the tools in place to to make it happen yeah for sure and these sort of shared beliefs or values like veganism how important do you think it is to have that in building strong and lasting relationships it's certainly a good starting point you eat food you know we eat meals three times a day if you can share that with someone who has like-minded vision not only from a dietary point of view but a moral standpoint that is a great place to start i mean there's some good stats 15 percent of vegans and vegetarians have changed their diet for a partner you are twice as likely to go back to eating meat if you live with a meat eater so this idea that isn't it beneficial for a vegan to date a meat eater and then you know they can convert them to veganism it actually happens the other way as well and in my circle it's happened more the other way than it has in the way that we think it should and it kind of touches on what I was um, speaking about before with social norms and pressures. You're far more likely to concede to what everyone else is doing than you are to implement some kind of revolution. So our standpoint is why not find your vegan person and try and start from that basis. It's not the solution to finding a partner, you know, finding someone who eats the same way as you, but it's a great starting point to build a, a relationship on. That's great. And in terms of the community aspect, is there anything that you've done offline so far that's worked for you, apart from the plans that you want to do with the communities? So we haven't done anything so far. We certainly want to do some dating events, but we will do some more general community stuff. And our kind of like soft vision for the future is to turn 
turn passive animal lovers into well-connected advocates. So we not only want to connect people, but we want to kind of turn them on to try and inspire change. That's our kind of overarching mission. And something we've kind of done a lot of research on is this idea of social dynamics and the science of, of social networks and how we can try and create change. It's a bit off topic, but I can kind of go into it because I think it is really Yeah, that's, yeah, totally. Any kind of social movement that has friction, so one that goes against the grain, against the norm doesn't spread in the way that we traditionally thought it would when it comes to network sciences so this idea of this viral nature you know you create a message that's sticky you get influential people to spread that message and all of a sudden it's adopted to the mainstream that doesn't happen with an idea like veganism where you're going against the grain and you're having to concede to social pressures the example is you know imagine you have a church and you want to reform that church if you start in the middle with the pastor and they say hey everyone needs to change their outlook on this issue you're going to get friction from everyone saying you know why are we making that change i'm not going to make that change whereas if you have it from the outside if you have if you build momentum from the outside you have people who go to the church every so often who are perhaps not that well connected with each other who come together and start kind of snowballing this idea you then bring it into the middle and you create change so the idea is that a movement like veganism has to be spread on the periphery by connecting people together and that's essentially what we're doing with grazer we're connecting people in local communities who are not connected mm -hmm. and we're building that connection and we're trying to get them to inspire change and push the movement into the into the mainstream that's something that is missing and i think it's a big blind spot you know we don't have a sense of community we don't have social cohesion as a movement and all the successful social movements that of the past have had that so i see what we're doing is goes beyond dating it's catalyzing change by connecting the movement from the outside in yeah that's amazing and also what you said about you know, connecting with animal rights movements. I do think that vegans who are vegan for the animals tend to also last longer as vegans. Would you agree on that? There is that thing that a lot of vegans say when a vegan then goes back to eating meat is, oh, you know, they're never vegan to begin with because if you were vegan, you wouldn't, you know, yeah. blah, blah, blah. I personally kind of disagree with that, but I get the sentiment, you know, if you see it as a moral guiding principle and you change it because of, you know, I don't know, access to food or whatever it is or social pressures, then you're valuing that convenience over right. an animal's life. And that doesn't match well with the previous kind of moral framework. But I oh, know, yes, it's a... <laughs> It's a, it's a difficult world to navigate as a vegan, I think. And that's why we're doing mm. what we do as well. Is, you know, there's so many pressures come from friends, family, work environment. They're all kind of pushing you to go with the grain. And I think it's Melanie Joy that says, you know, the reason why people eat meat is because other people eat meat. I'm paraphrasing, but that is the reason we're raised to eat meat culturally as a whole we kind of unconsciously put stuff into our shopping basket because we've just trained ourselves over time to eat what we eat because we've always had that way and so to break that mold is difficult and you've been vegan for a long time i think it was it five years before you started a company right you, you mentioned 2011 yeah i was at university and i watched a documentary called garbage warriors which is about this architect who builds this like eco house that you know uses every drop of water four times and all this kind of stuff and as a student i was like oh my god we can live like sustainably isn't this mad like what else are we doing that is really bad for the environment and then i found out about food there's this great book called how bad are bananas and it looks at the carbon emissions of every type of food and it puts it directly into pure carbon emissions and i was just mind blown and then i i went vegetarian and then vegan pretty quickly after that amazing yeah I was at this climate conference, the Blue Earth Summit. Del Vince was there from Ecotricity talking about the cow in the room. And in order to reduce our personal emissions, the best thing that you can do is to go plant-based. But I still feel that a lot of climate activists don't know that message and aren't plant-based themselves. What do you think could be done, especially, I guess, from your background in film? You know, there's there has been documentaries, but they kind of touch on it. Even The Inconvenient Truth kind of touched on it, but went away very quickly and focused on the oil and gas industries. I think more needs to be done with the, with that connection. There's There has been some great documentaries recently, but I'm just thinking that more needs to be done. What's your opinion on, I guess, more on the documentary side, especially because it affected you and it has affected me as well? Yeah, I mean, documentaries have been a big part of, you know, forming my you know outlook on life. I think they're obviously super important a cultural perspective as well shifting culture and conversations and we're also up against the opposite which is misinformation and a big conglomerate of companies that come together to try and create chaos and dampen any efforts we make in trying to get information across to the people having information is one thing but you know changing your diet requires more than 
information sometimes. You know, some people will just watch a documentary and change over life. Some mm. people documentary and they don't absorb it in the same way. And, you know, there's multiple factors as to why that would be the case. Culture, social issues, or even just a failure to see how their actions are have implications. Or maybe they, you know, they're not in a you know, in the right mindset at the time. Um, things like that. But um yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I know a lot of people who saw conspiracy and then start eating fish straight away sort of thing, but they probably lasted a week. And it's such a shame, isn't it? And now they have built a big community, by the way. But I did hear some personal antidotes from people who had tried it and then, you know, suddenly went back to their old ways, which is not what you want. And there is some data that says, you know, if you see animal abuse on a more regular basis, so like on your feed or or you watch content with animal abuse, you're more likely to stay vegan over a long period of time. Interesting. Um, if you only watch the conspiracy and then get back to, you know, watching your general stuff and you don't engage with that beyond watching that documentary once, you're probably quite likely to fall off the bandwagon. And especially if you haven't made friends who are doing the same thing as you. Do you want to tell me about some of the struggles that you've had in your journey with creating this app and I guess more on the, on the management side and also fundraising? Yeah, so we launched in 2017 and we got a massive amount of traction and we didn't expect it. We were in like the top 50 of the app charts and stuff like that. We did you know super well on launch and then we went to raise pretty quickly afterwards and we had an investor lined up and then you know we were going through the documents for a few months and then the investor pulled out and at the time I was also going through some personal struggles with family issues and even relationship issues and all this combined into one cocktail and I, was, I felt maybe I'm not the right person maybe this is not the right time so I kind of went into hibernation for a little bit and then during COVID I was kind of revitalized uh, to kind of create change and I brought on a co-founder and we raised on Cedars and we got traction through you know friends and family and starting with some angel investors and we launched and we made perhaps some decisions that made it harder for us to raise um, after that which was you know we didn't implement a revenue model we thought we're going to create a really good app and do a marketing campaign and show how easy it is for us to get used on the app and that'll be enough to get us some more money coming in but the time that we were raising was the worst time ever the plant-based industry kind of hit a bit of a wall investors kind of dried up um the san francisco bank collapsed and then the you know the war of ukraine so all these things happened that kind of made it more difficult for startups to raise and particularly for plant-based businesses so what we did was we stripped everything back and um we reduced our burn rate massively try and increase our runway and just do our best to find an investor who meets with our kind of vision we also changed our vision a little bit and we discussed a bit more about the community aspect and perhaps some of the impact vision that was kind of rejigged to kind of approach a new uh, type of investor. So we kind of made these changes to try and survive. And then thankfully that strategy paid off. But yeah, it was, it was a really tough period. You know, there were times where we thought, okay, this is not going to happen for us. And, you know, in those times, I guess, you know, you have to adapt, change, grow, all those things to to try and succeed. So um, yeah, very happy that we've managed to do that and, you know, secure an investor who, you know, really backs what we're doing and believes in us as, as people as well, which is also very important. So Congratulations on the raise. That's amazing that you've done that. And I really like the idea that you're going to be making it into a community. And then hopefully we'll see you in, as in the density, improve in those other locations that you mentioned, LA, New York, Berlin as well, and other parts of the UK. But yeah, that's what we need, don't we? We need more of these bubbles and communities to be formed to then grow bigger, I guess, to, to, to your point. So yeah, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your story with us. No problem. Thanks for having me. Thank yeah. You. Speak to you again soon. Yes, thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.